All right, we are live with Let's Talk Live with H-A-W-M Law. We have a special guest in our studios today. We have Franz Lopez, um, who is serves as a guardian of litem and who is a Florida family law attorney. Before we delve into the program, just give it a couple minutes, you know, a couple seconds, just for people to come on, get their popcorn, whatever they need, because we have some very, very valuable information today for people going through family law issues. Um, we're talking about guardian ad litem and what they can do to help your family law custody case. Franz, tell me about yourself. Who are you? I know you're fabulous. That's why I have you on the show. But who is the great Franz Lopez? And why did you get into the garden being a garden at Lytle? Oh, Sasha, you're just amazing. Um, that's why I hang out with you, because you just really fan out my ego. Um, my name is Franz Lopez. I am a um, solo proprietor. I have a family law practice here in Orlando, Florida. Um, um, uh, the bulk of my work is garden ad litem work and some immigration cases. But um, I started out doing a lot of uh, family law and then just found a niche doing guardian ad litem work. Right. What motivates you to continue doing guardian ad litem work? What's your why? Oh, the why is really simple. It is, it is in the realm of family law, when you can go into a family and go in there and, and figure out how you can help this family, especially the children who have no voice, really, when the parents are, are litigating issues in family court, when you're the voice for the children and you can have an impact that can be positive in that child's life and, and, and try to help and make the proper recommendations to improve the lives of that family as they litigate the issues, there's, there's really nothing like it when you see the aftermath, if it turns out to be positive. Okay. So Franz, tell me exactly what is a guardian ad litem? Okay, when we talk about, um, when we speak about guardian ad litem, especially in the family court or what we know here in, in say in Orange County, the domestic relations division, this is a person um, who's a neutral appointee uh, made by the court, who is known as we say quotations on quotations, the next best friend of the child. This is the person who will investigate and make recommendations as to what will be in the best interest of the child. Um, when we say guardian ad litem, you'll also hear GAL, guardian ad litem. So GAL, that's the short term. The GAL said, the GAL wants, the GAL recommends. This, the GAL is appointed by, um, by the, uh, pursuant to the Florida chapter 61 proceedings in family court. And that basically includes, when we talk about the proceedings, what type of proceedings would we have? Well, one is the petitions for dissolution of marriage, which typically we know is just divorce, but that's how what we call it, petitions for dissolution of marriage. Paternity issues, that's just different that, you know, um, the parents are not married. So the, you know, the parent is trying, one of the parents is trying to establish parental responsibility time sharing issues and what we would call any other relief that they're requesting. And we're also sometimes when these parents have already gone to court, they've litigated, they may have to go back and change some things, right? So we call those modification proceedings. And usually what you see is the modification of the parenting plan. Perhaps the shared parental responsibility needs to be looked at or the time sharing. When we talk about time sharing, um, some people may understand that that that's what we used to call visitation. Parental responsibility is what we used to call custody. OK, and then adoption issues. Um, typically, you see that GAL coming in if there's issues with the termination of parental rights that may be disputed. Right. But what if, I'm sorry, Sasha, I want to I want to emphasize this. One of the most other than knowing what a GAL is, it is important to know what a GAL is not. A GAL, a guardian ad litem, is not the attorney of the child. That is the question yeah. I was going to ask because a lot of times when I even bring up the issue of a guardian ad litem and my, you know, to my clients or to other people, you know, people get the impression that a guardian is going to somehow 
represent the child or take the child away from the parents or you know just explain to to, to, to our listeners today what exactly what exactly a, a guardian is and what what she is not well we're going to delve into that right but right now i want to make the distinguishment that the guardian ad litem represents the best interest we'll talk about what best interest means but the so it's what what would be in the best interest of the child what would be good for that child but the attorney ad litem is the one that is the lawyer for a child and that may happen depending on what's going on in a case but that's what the child wants not so not necessarily when a guardian ad litem is working on the best interest analysis an attorney ad litem will want and go and litigate what the child wants. Those are two very different roles. Thank you for clarifying that. So do, do guardian ad litems have to be attorneys? No, the qualifications of a guardian ad litem are specified in chapter 61.402. I'm being specific because maybe you, you know, we we're speaking to the larger community, but also some attorneys that may have a case and say, Oh, that's interesting. Wait a minute. Let me, let me see how, how can we work this in, in my case? Maybe that's helpful. So 61.402 is very specific. It says a person appointed as a guardian ad litem pursuant to 61.401 chapter 61.401 of the Florida statutes must be either a certified by the guardian ad litem program pursuant to chapter 39.81 b certified by a not for profit legal aid organization as defined in section 68.096 or like me and what I know as an attorney who is a member in good standing of the Florida bar. So typically when we are working in cases in the family court, it is, it is, you know, pretty typical to see that a guardian ad litem is also an attorney. Again, remembering that even though I'm an attorney, I am not the attorney for the child. That's important to know. So what exactly is your role then? And if you're not the attorney of the child, and I know you mentioned you're acting in the best interest of the child, well, what are your roles and what are the duties and the responsibilities of a guardian ad litem in the family law case? Right, so that's clearly defined in chapter 61.403. And like I said, for the child and for everybody to know, yet your title is next best friend of the child, but it's also, you're an investigator. That's what you're doing. You're conducting an investigation. You are evaluating a lot of information, a lot of evidence. You're speaking to a lot of people. And so it is the ultimate role of the GAL to, to speak to all these people in the family. Um, and, I'll, and I'll break it down and witnesses and look at, looking at documents. And then at the end or in the interim, because sometimes we have to make recommendations in the middle of the case, that may help and be in the best interest of the child or the ultimate, which is to put a report together and say, these are my final recommendations. So it usually, um, the GALs work, when I say break it down, the GAL is gonna review the pleadings of the case. Those are the documents, what's being filed? Who's, who, you know, what, what documents have been filed that relate to the issues affecting the child? And then the GAL is going to interview the parties Typically, it's the parents, um, the child, or multiple children in the case. The potential witnesses depends on, on what are the issues in the, in the case. So school personnel, uh, therapists, if they're involved, uh, medical providers, family members, because the parents are going to say, I want you to talk to one, two, three, and each side will have their witnesses, neighbors. It just depends. It could be coaches whoever really has something to say or has observed and has relevant in information that would be pertinent to the case. The other thing that um, the GL is gonna do is have in the court order appointing the GL is have um, the authority to get records from the schools, from hospitals, psychologists and psychiatrists. Now that's pursuant to chapter 61.403 section two for the attorneys that are watching this. The guardian ad litem through counsel may request a court order to um, for expert examinations of the child, the child's parents, or interested parties in the action um, by medical doctors and mental health professionals. We see that, but again, there's no this. Every family is different, so it depends what it is that's going on in the family. 
that a GAL may say, we need an evaluation. It could be um, an, an academic evaluation. The child perhaps is not doing well in school, or there could be some more serious issues going in the family and we need psychological evaluations of either the children or all the parents. And all of that, all the culmination of all, all that, the te all the statements from witnesses speaking with the children, uh, the documents that you're examining, that's going to help to, to help the guardian litem be able to make oral recommendations or written recommendations and the final recommendations when and if you go to trial. What, what types of cases would you requ what would require a guardian litem or you know when would you you know do you recommend that a person or attorneys or a family consider using a guardian ad litem for their case? Well, the types of cases typically that we see guardian ad litems going into again are family law cases. So in a divorce issue, right, the dissolution of a petition um, of marriage, um, paternity actions, parents are, are litigating. They just can't agree on something. And sometimes instead of having just the attorneys litigate and litigate, to bring in that neutral appointee to come in and look at what's going in in, in the family because we have access to so much information versus it would cost so much. There's such an expense, even though it's an added expense to have a, a garden ad litem, but the garden ad litem can talk to so many people and then get a really sound perspective. Um, I have also know that in the independency court, that's where there's abuse, abandonment, and neglect issues, uh, criminal court and probate court. I'm not familiar with really the specifics of what goes on in those courts, but that is those are areas where a guardian ad litem could be appointed. Okay. And you mentioned earlier about the best interests of the child, mm -hmm. that as a guardian ad litem, your job, your sole function is to make a recommendation based on the best interest of the child. What exactly does that mean? Well, I, I have to quote this chapter because it's so important. Chapter 61.13 is um, section three is very, very clear. And let me read we know that. it all so well. Yeah, <laughs> that, that, family law attorneys. <laughs> that the best interest of the child is the primary consideration for the purposes of establishing, developing, approving, or modifying a parenting plan, which includes a time-sharing schedule. So when we talk about best interest, there are 20 factors, A through T, that a guardian ad litem would need to look at and be able to provide information as to each and every single factor. And that's called the best interest analysis. And through that analysis and written analysis, the guardian ad litem is then able to submit a final recommendations to the court. So when you do your reports, you're looking at each of those best interest factors and making re recommendations as to each one. Is that how it you would want a report a guardian's report would read right absolutely and and if i may let me just cite some of like a couple of the factors maybe two or three okay go ahead one of them that i think is really really important is even the first one the demonstrated capacity and disposition of each parent to facilitate and encourage a close and continuing parent-child relationship to honor the time sharing schedule and to be reasonable when changes are required. The court wants to know, are these parents really co-parenting well? Who's doing it? Who's honoring the, the time sharing schedule? Remember time sharing, like it was what we used to call visitation. And if there's changes ready, are we, are we, are we doing everything possible to you know, accommodate? You know, this would be good for, for Susie, Johnny, Billy to go to be with dad or go be with mommy. Um, the, another one is uh, we look at the moral and fitness of, of the parents, the mental and physical health of the parents, this home, the school and community record of the child. That's when the GAL goes and speaks to the teachers and, and, and all the other people that may be interacting with that child. So I just gave you three of them. So imagine there's 20 of them. So tell me, is a guardian ad litem really helpful or does it hurt a case? You know, which one is it? it does, does a guardian help in the in family law cases? 
I think a guardian ad litem can be very, very helpful in a, in a family law case. Think about it. Like I said, every family dynamic is, um, is different. But understanding what the family is going through, especially the issues affecting the child, the children, will be very important for the GL to be able to make recommendations. Um, and, and any interim, because the family could be in crisis, the child could be in crisis. So it is so important for the, the guardian ad litem to understand, um, you know, with this, I didn't talk about that, the scope of employment, which is in the, in the court order appointing the guardian ad litem. So what are the issues? And are we going in as she's appointed, are we going in quickly to court? So that who does she have to speak to quickly to be able to assess and to help this family? Because sometimes an investigation can, can, can take time, right? But there's really immediate issues that need to be addressed. A GL can be so helpful, but the GAL should be familiar with the community um, resources and be able to, to, to help and identify medical and mental health providers in the area to be able to help the GAL give sound recommendations to the parents, to the attorneys, to the court. Um, focusing on the child by speaking with the child, um, the parents, the teachers, the medical providers, mental health providers, neighbors, family members, will just give a very sound perspective. You have so much information and hopefully that is enough to be able to make um, interim recommendations if necessary, but definitely will be important um, in doing the best interest analysis to make the final recommendations. Absolutely. But I know um, guardian ad litems are court appointed, but who pays for a guardian ad litem? Is this being paid for by the court or the families involved? Well, typically in the, um, in the family court and the way um, I've seen it is that the parents, the parties involved, are the ones that are responsible for the cost of the GAL. The court will make the determination for the allocation of costs and the, and the responsibility of who pays. Sometimes it's both parties that are going to be uh, paying. Sometimes it may be one that the court may say mom will pay or dad is responsible for the payment or for the initial retainer and then the parties will then split the rest of the costs whatever it means. So the terms of the, of the payment in the um, GAL's appointment is very important. I do know that, um, I do know that um, it just varies with each, each family. Are there programs out there to help families who cannot necessarily afford the cost of an attorney GAL or a non-attorney GAL? So I think it depends on the area. I think um, there are pro bono programs and the person seeking the GAL um, should be able to call the local bar association and find out um, and make inquiries as to do we have pro bono GAL? I know I've done it. I've done it with um, when, when attorneys have called me and said, you know, one attorney is why I did one pro bono called me and basically said, can you do this? And I did it through um, legal aid right. in Orlando. Also, I'm, I'm not sure, but a local bar, Orange County Bar Association, check to see if there's a modest means program, if they have something that an attorney would be willing to take on um, a GAL function and, and, and for a lesser charge. Also be aware that, that GALs, we don't have a standard charge for the hourly rate. So you can, you know, your attorneys can look around or yourself, if you're, you are not represented, can find out who's doing GAL work. The hourly rates vary. Sometimes they are able to do sliding scale depending right. on income. So there's all different ways to be able to have this resource. So procedurally, let's talk about if a GAL is appointed to my case or to a family law case, what, what should I expect to happen? What are the steps that we'll go through in a, in, in a situation like that? So the first thing is the, the court order appointing the GAL. And um, typically the appointed GAL will get a copy of the court order and know that uh, a phone call will be coming through or a contact from the attorneys. Hey, you've been appointed on the case. So then the um, contact should be made with the GAL, the parties will contact the GAL and say, hey, the court order says I have to pay you, your retainer, um, in so many days, how can I go about paying it? Um, 
and 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 that's how it begins as soon as the the gal the court order specifies upon retainer received the g the investigation may um begin the gal hmm? i was going to ask do, do the parties get to pick who their gal is it's court appointed but does the court tell you you're using x as your g x person as your gal or do the parties have any say in that process Typically, the parties do have a say. They do their research, especially if they're represented by attorneys. The attorneys know um, who the GALs are um, out there doing the work and, and are able to tell their clients, um, these are the GALs that we know. Um, some, some attorneys will, will make the calls and find out if there's availability, if the GAL can take on um, the case. So definitely there's a say. Now, if the parent, if, typically if, if the parties are quarreling, um, the court may say, bring three options and then the, the 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 court will make the decision you can't agree so i will decide you want a jail this is well this will be the jail but there's definitely a, a say so I, I cut you off earlier so tell you we're talking about the process you know once a jail is appointed we mentioned that the court orders there the family is going to make payment and then what happens next Right. So the GAL um, Im immediately will reach out and even getting the court, getting the court order reaches out to the attorneys or to the parents or if there's guardians involved in the case. And basically, uh, I like to send out a, a letter saying this is who this is me. I'm appointed. Um, this is your date to have this payment made by um, send me the, the pleadings. I need the, the pleadings. Those are the court documents and basically um, send me the list of witnesses that you want me to um, investigate. And you can also expect that upon the payment of the retainer, the parties are scheduled for their, their interviews. Um, and the GAL, I would think, would determine when is the appropriate time to meet the child or the children, right? We all have our different ways of, of, of doing it. Um, and and basically the investigation begins. You're, you're starting to get the pleadings. You're going to be speaking with the parents. Then you're going to start to call these witnesses, meeting the children involved. So should the families expect that the GAL will be coming to their home or are these meetings taking place at the attorney's, at the GAL's office? How does that typically work? Well, typically let's talk about like pre-COVID when everything, <laughs> when everything was just, oh, so normal. Um, yeah, it was very common to see, to, to have a GAL that could do an announced visit or an unannounced visit. It just depends. Mm -hmm. Um, it's, it's very typical to have the children come in and meet you at your office or you to go to the school and speak with the children. I can only speak for myself. I like to first meet the children with, if, if it's two parents involved, I like the opportunity to meet the children in my office with the the parent and and with the other parent. And then, you know, the child or the children become, you know, more accustomed, like, okay, that's Miss France. And then you meet privately with the child. That's important to have that alone time. And you Trust can do that. Them. You could do that if, at the school. You could do that um, in a playground. You can go tour the home. The, it was very typical to just go into a home and be able to just tour, show me your world, show me your room. What, is, what does this home look like? And, and there's so much to, um, to really, you, you, there's so much to, to information you get just by visiting children in their home life, in their home right now with the parents. Um, and it's important also that to know that the garden at Lightham is a party to the case, Sasha. Now that means that the garden at Lightham must be notified of all proceedings through counsel, okay? You're entitled to be present at mediation, okay? You're entitled to be at any depositions that may be set. You're entitled um, to go to the hearings, depending if some hearings may not be issues affecting the child. So the guardian ad litem may not appear for that court hearing, but all those issues affecting the child it is expected that a guardian ad litem will be there. Yeah. And of course, if there is a trial, the guardian ad litem will be there. Um, with these types of family law matters, you're expecting to see guardian ad litem probably in some of the more contentious matters, right? 
So what happens when the parties or one of the parties disagrees with the guardian's recommendation? What's the outcome? You know, or do, is there any recourse for that particular party that does not agree with the recommendation? Okay. So let's first talk about what the expectation is, at least for, for me. But the expectation is that as the GL, um, you're provided with all the necessary and pertinent documents, the information, you've had access to the witnesses, to the children, you've conducted a thorough investigation. And during the investigation, there's always the opportunity to provide additional evidence that may help during the investigation. So just because the guardian litem has spoken to the parties once, um, it's, 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 typical that the guardian ad litem may need to speak to you again and say, I need this. Or you may say, you know what? I forgot to tell you about ABC and I can provide you with that evidence or I can provide you with this documentation. I can provide you with the information that will, will that will show you that this happened um, or whatever the issue may be. The parties may disagree um, with the GAO recommendations. That, that happens, yes. However, it's extremely important to understand that the GAL makes recommendations. So that's important. The GAL is not the decision maker. It is the court. That is the court that makes the ultimate decisions. So if the GAL has offered interim or the final recommendations, it's the court that's going to make the decision in the case. And so of all the issues that are before the court, so all the parties, remember, the GL will be a party, the parents are parties, they have their representatives or they're representing themselves. Everyone will have the opportunity to present their information, their position, and any evidence to support that position. Absolutely. And what advice, just general advice, do you have for families who are currently using a guardian ad litem or considering using a guardian ad litem for their family law case? It's an asset. It really is an asset to have someone that, you know, you, you might think, oh, I don't have the money for that, et cetera, et cetera. But it really, it can be such an incredible asset because as the parties are litigating, you have a neutral appointee that is specifically there for your child or your children and, and, and will have a wealth of information as to what is going on and perhaps can give great insight as to how to help this family heal and perhaps stop the litigation and be able to incorporate these recommendations that perhaps both sides can agree to and that will be for the, the best in the best interest of the child. Absolutely. Friends, I, it was such a pleasure, you know, being able to sit with you and talk about such an important topic for our listeners today. If you are tuning in, it's been Let's Talk Live with HAWM. We had the fabulous attorney, Franz Lopez, with us talking about guardian ad litems, that, you know, what they do, who they are, and how they can assist you in your family law case. Um, we've gotten lots of information. This video will be up for you to review it later on, but it has been such an absolute wonderful afternoon, friends, talking to you about this topic today. Thank you for taking the time out of your busy schedule as a family law attorney and guardian ad litem here in Central Florida um, to help us educate the public on this particular topic today. Thank you so much, Sasha, for even inviting me. And it's, it's been a pleasure. And uh, I hope that the information is helpful to the community at large. It absolutely was. Tell us, can you tell our listener and other attorneys out there how they can contact you um, for help with their family law guardian ad litem cases? Sure. My number is 407. My office number is 407-897-1088. All right. Thank you very much for tuning in. It's been Let's Talk Live with H-A-W-M Law. You know how to reach us. It's 407-802-3223. Have a wonderful Memorial Day weekend. Yes. Take care, everyone.